forgiven if you don't know who this guy is. <laughs> Richard Potter, pretty obscure. Uh, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I'm going to make a very fair guess that most of you uh, had not heard of Richard Potter ever, maybe till this year, maybe till this was announced, maybe, I don't know, maybe within the last few years. Uh, 200 years ago, Richard Potter was the most famous entertainer in America. 200 years ago, he was the most famous entertainer in all of the United States. He was also the most popular entertainer, and he was also seen in person by more people than anyone else in America. Those are three very different ways of saying something big about his impact on the country. He was also, as it happens, black. To be more specific, he was mulatto. Richard Potter was the son of a white father and a black mother. His mother had been uh, captured on the coast of Guinea as probably as a young teenager, brought over to this country, and ultimately brought up to Boston, sold in the port of Boston as a slave. His father was a uh, roguish patriarch of a local family. This was in the Hopkinton area of Massachusetts, uh, who had 10 children by his wife, uh, as well as probably two by uh, Potter's mother, Potter and his younger brother. Uh, as a mulatto, as it happened, Richard Potter was well, if you thought he was white, you would say he was a dark-complexioned man. If you thought he was black, you would say he was a light-complexioned black man. Uh, if you weren't sure, you might guess that he was, uh, one of the frequent guesses was East Asian, uh, often said to have been the, fa the, the child of an English father and an East Indian means India proper today, an Indian, a, 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 a Hindi mother. Uh, there were other guesses also, but, but the facts are very simple. And he grew up in the Boston area. Everybody in Boston knew he was black his entire life. He traveled around the entire country. And it's pretty fair to say that most of the time he was in Ohio or Missouri or Mississippi or Florida, they did not know that he was black. They assumed he was white. That was all the easier because he was not only light complexioned black man, uh, 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 black man or dark complexioned white man, he was always very gentlemanly in his behavior and deportment. He dressed handsomely and properly. Uh, he uh, always turned aside uh, jibes with humor. He was almost courtly in his manners. He was a, a, a perfect gentleman in his behavior. And didn't hurt that he had a big bluff white man who was a, a master horseman, among other things, uh, working as his assistant all the time he was traveling around the country. Uh, you know, if, if that guy is saying boss to you, you must be white too. Okay. I think I'll start by picking apart all four of these particular points and uh, seeing what happens and then give you a sense of some of the major trajectories of Potter's life. Uh, let's take black first. Uh, I'm frequently asked, uh, was, was he ever a slave? He was born in 1783 died in 1835, so born uh, just as peace was being signed uh, at the end of the Revolutionary War. Uh, no, he was never a slave. His mother was a slave, and his uh, four older sisters were all born into slavery. But uh, as it happened, uh, he lived on a very handsome, uh, even noble estate in the Hopkinton area because his owner, his, his mother's owner, had been the tax collector for the Port of Boston, which was the second most financially lucrative appointment 
in the Crown's power after the governorship. And uh, the owner of that uh, estate was a, a baronet, Sir Charles Henry Franklin, who moved to uh, Hopkinton and built a, a, a wonderful grand country estate. Uh, he had died long before this time. Uh, the estate had passed into the hands of his wife's family, and his wife had come from uh, uh, Marblehead. Uh, he'd, he'd picked up a scullery girl, actually, and uh, groomed her, I think you would say, today, <laughs> and eventually had her educated properly and eventually lived with her in sin and then did the right thing and married her. It was a very romantic story, actually. But uh, Richard Potter, by 1782, the year before he was born, uh, slavery was uh, de facto abolished in uh, Middlesex County by virtue of, I think, the Mumbet case. Uh, even before the, when it was abolished in Massachusetts, uh, de facto, the year after. So by the time Potter was born, no, he wasn't a slave. He was a servant. Uh, as I said, in Boston, everyone knew he was black because they knew his roots, his background, they knew all about him. Uh, his wife, Sally, Sally Potter, uh, was also a mulatto, probably from uh, a, a, uh, an estate uh, of a nearby town, actually. And she was quite a beautiful woman. She was quite petite. She was a superb dancer. She became a, a trained partner in some of his acts. She would sing duets with him. She would do a few uh, performances of her own. And uh, he featured her on many of her programs. She was quite an asset. Uh, Richard Potter was known in 1810, I think it was the New York Post, uh, published an article. Richard Potter at that time had never performed in New York City, but he was a known performer by that time, and it was published that uh, one of his predecessors, Rowdy, Richard Potter, a colored gentleman, were these performers. He was known to be black by at least the cognoscenti in New York City as early as 1810. Uh, by the time he returned to New England after a trip around the entire country in oh, 1819 through 1823, almost everybody, not quite everybody, but almost everybody knew or suspected that he was black. If you made too big a fuss about that, however, that meant you couldn't go to the show. And everybody wanted to go to the show. So. Usually, people didn't make too big a fuss about it. The show. Well, what was special about the show? Uh, Richard Potter did many things. He was most famously today to his heirs a magician and a ventriloquist. And I, ensure, I assure you that uh, experts in both of those fields have known very, very, very well all our lifetimes who Richard Potter was because he is very important to their histories and these professionals tend to care about the histories of their, of their craft. Richard Potter also was an actor in many ways. He did one-man performances. He did uh, duet performances of scenes from popular uh, theater uh, on, on, on the major city stages along with his, with his wife. Uh, he did excerpts uh, from many plays. He also created many of his own acts. Uh, he perfected a, uh, and, and highly modified and developed a, a one-man kind of presentation called the Dissertation on Noses, in which he would put on a different shaped nose, very, very simple little prop, maybe a wig if he was going to change sex or whatever, and he would uh, perform a monologue in the persona of the person exemplified by that nose. For example, the, uh, the sharp nose of a shrew. And he would have a, 
uh, a woman's wig and a dress, and he would hobble around the stage, and he would behave shrewishly, basically. He had a wonderful monologue about, you know, never letting, uh, never letting the husband or never letting your man get the last word, that sort of thing. Uh, or you could use the, uh, the red nose of a toper, a drunkard, and he would go into a drunk routine and so forth. And he would also perform songs that went along with these characters. He was becoming a one-man song and dance and acting show. And he was actually doing incredibly rich things to American, American theater at that time that nobody had ever done and that major stage uh, performers picked up on and developed and imitated and uh, he leaves a legacy there too. Here's an early broadside uh, to show you the act would be divided into three parts. Uh, the magic was typically first. If he was going to do ventriloquism it was typically last and here we have the wag of Windsor in the middle. Uh, the dissertation on noses is featured in this one. Here's Newport, the theater. Part one, the ventriloquist. Part two, the dissertation on noses. Uh, the entreact between parts two and three is Richard Potter's son, Richard Jr. Master Richard, because he's still uh, a junior and ventriloquism in part three. There was something for everyone in these and add to that the fact that Potter was incredible with children. He welcomed children, he gained much of his training by practicing on children in the streets of Boston and in households where he worked. Uh, Children adored him. Mothers sometimes would threaten, you know, Potter, you know, the magician with his black robes is, you know, going to take care of you to behave. As soon as they saw Potter, there was just no threat anymore. They would do anything to go see Potter. Uh, so he was very, very family friendly and he became famous for being family friendly. It was, it was proper for the most decorous people to patronize Potter. That worked very much in his favor. Uh, people after he died starting to remember him and the memories became especially powerful in the circa 1870s after the Civil War. This country had just been torn to shreds and people were trying to think back to what was so great about when they were younger and they remembered Richard Potter and what was one of the things that was so interesting is for many of them the ventriloquism was the essence of what he did and for many of them it was the magic and for many of them it was a dissertation on noses and you know he really did have something for everybody he pleased all sorts of people and all sorts of tastes uh, I'd said most famous and most beloved and also most widely beheld. And I think that is incredibly important in this man's legacy. Uh, in the 1820s, presidents didn't even go out and campaign. You wouldn't, you wouldn't see the president if you were living next door to the state he was the governor or the senator in. Uh, major tragedians from England or their American successors, they might be very, very famous on their tours. They would tour three or four or five big cities and that was it. And you had to have a lot of money for theater tickets like that. It wasn't like the masses of America were seeing these people. Uh, the small theaters that traveled circuits, maybe they did the Mississippi River Valley, maybe they did the Ohio River Valley, maybe they did the, uh, the East Coast or whatever, but they did that circuit or, you know, maybe two different circuits, that was it. They would be known and beheld regionally in one part of the country. In this four and a half year period, 
Richard Potter traveled almost everywhere in America that was part of America at that time. And no one had ever, ever done anything remotely like that before. The big people hit the big cities and that was it. Richard Potter not only hit the big cities, all his career, and this again very much distinguished him, and it has to do with appealing to kids and the locals and so forth, always stopped at the little towns in between. He didn't just go from city to city. He went from city to village to burg to hamlet to city and on and on. And he had such drawing power that uh, when he went through Ohio, he would maybe stay in one little town in Ohio for a week and people would come from dozens and scores of miles around. And they would probably come for more than one show because he had so great a repertoire that he could vary it. And maybe he wouldn't do the ventriloquism one night and maybe he wouldn't do the, uh, the dissertation on noses one night, but if you came a different night, you could hear it or see it. So he just, he appeared everywhere. Let me pick this apart a little bit because it starts off with what was for him an incredible bang. Uh, he's, he leaves Andover, heads south down to New York and Philadelphia before he fires back up north. When Richard Potter opened in New York in 1819, New York was just exploding into a very big-headed sense of self by that time, shall we say. There were a lot of daily newspapers in New York by now. There was competition for uh, press and attention. And uh, people were reading the papers to see what to do and whom to follow and whatever. When Richard Potter went to New York, he opened in a big venue and had, he had never performed there before. Uh, I'm, I don't believe he'd ever even been there as an apprentice with uh, one of the people he apprenticed with before. Uh, he opened and uh, almost immediately there were very interesting and favorable letters to the editor, apparently genuine letters to the editor, uh, praising the decorum of his act, the skill of his ventriloquism and of his magic, the uh, decorousness of his, I guess I said that, uh, the, the, uh, the gentility of his entire uh, carriage. And people kept coming and then all of a sudden news articles started appearing about how the fashionable people were seen patronizing Potter. Oh, that was an inducement. Now, if you want to be seen with the fashionable people, that's where you go. And so people start to crowd in. He'd barely been there a week or so. And one of the uh, then most prominent poets in New York, coming to prominence, but writing anonymously, published a poem on the front page of the New York Post, the Evening Post, to Richard Potter Ventriloquist, or to Mr. Potter Ventriloquist, I forget which. It's on the front, on the first page of the paper. And it celebrated Richard Potter as this great ventriloquist and he has this great idea. Uh, let's get him into the legislature, why don't we? That bunch of people who spend all their time nattering and getting nothing done. And whenever somebody gets up to, to, to talk the usual garbage, we'll have Potter throw his voice and project his speech into and give him something sensible and decorous and important to say. And we'll have him do that for everybody. And, you know, so we might as well make him Speaker of the House. This was trading on an old notion of what a ventriloquist could do. You know, throw your voice to someone, you know, not just at a distance, but make it seem to come from someone. So it was, it was a witticism, but it was also this incredible endorsement, this celebration. Richard Potter, I think it is genuinely fair to say, was the first celebrity, as we would now use the word, that New York City ever had.
I will qualify that by saying that next year there was another even bigger celebrity, and the year after that there was another that was an even bigger celebrity, but there hadn't ever been one before that had that combination of acceptance and enthusiasm and staying power. He spent, oh, weeks and weeks and weeks in New York City playing to 500, 600 people at a time. He goes up into Canada to uh, Lower Canada, Quebec, and then Upper Canada. Now, now we would say uh, 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 Toronto and, uh, and then back down into this country at Buffalo and down through Pennsylvania and then across the country all the way to the Mississippi River. And he's entertaining all the way, stopping at the little towns, performing in the big towns. He gets to Mississippi. When he gets to Mississippi, uh, I'm sorry, when he gets to Missouri, it isn't even a state yet. It won't be a state until March. And he's there in, in late December or mid-December or something like that. Uh, and actually, it's illegal for any non-white to be in Missouri at the time, uh, which is one way of saying he's passing his white, I guess you could say. Also, another way of saying that this is a very dangerous place to be, potentially, for Richard Potter. He's quite a showman. He spins, as you can see, all of that time, and not just going straight down the Mississippi River, because uh, sometimes you find him performing in one place, and then he's performing further north than that the next week or two weeks later. Uh, he's traveling back and forth. He's probably going down by river, but everywhere else he's going by, uh, by horse and carriage. And uh, all of this way, he's black, and he's pulling this off. And there are sometimes dangers. And there was, in particular, an incident in Mobile, Mobile, where a uh, landlord turns him away because he says he's black. And Richard Potter accepts the rebuke and says nothing and turns away and finds another place and stays there for a week and uh, makes a mint of money in Mobile performing for a week. And uh, by the time that has happened, word has gotten to him. He has sources. Uh, that uh, people are planning to waylay him on his way out of town. So he lets it be known where he's going next the following morning, and then he goes the opposite direction that night and gets out of town safe with his money and heads across the country towards the East Coast. Uh, there's not a lot of money to be made in the southeast of the United States at this time if you're a performer. The big, uh, the big uh, places for performance and theater and uh, uh, discretionary expenditures are Savannah and Charleston. And surely this is where he was heading on his way north. But just as he gets to Augusta, Word is appearing in the Augusta newspapers of the Denmark Vesey, Vesey uh, slave uprising in Charleston, which throws the Deep South into an absolute racial panic. You just have no idea. Uh, Denmark Vesey, many of you probably know this, was a free black man. He was a literate man. Uh, the slave uprising, he was accused of having fomented, uh, involved other supposed ringleaders. Uh, Denmark Vesey, Vesey was, and was, was uh, outlined by the governor as being dangerous because he was literate. He could read things to blacks. And you know, since he was black, he could mingle with blacks. And so he could communicate news to blacks. Uh, one, one of the other ringleaders, uh, Mundy Gell, uh, Mundy was known as a, uh, a uh, 
sorcerer back in Africa. He had special influence over, over the blacks. Richard Potter was a black man who would sometimes advertise himself as the emperor of sorcerers. He was coming through this area at this time as a black magician. It would have been worth his life to go to Savannah or Charleston. And he was quick enough to realize this and took the Piedmont Inland Road. Uh, all of a sudden, a very slow trek around the country becomes a very fast dash up to about North Carolina, where he starts to feel safe and spending a lot of time and so forth. 1825, 1830, 1835. If you yourself hadn't seen Richard Potter in person, you probably knew somebody who did, who had. And that can be said of no one else in America at this time, I think. Think about that, because he was also, remember, increasingly known as a black man. And everybody has seen him all around the country. That couldn't be said about presidents, about other actors, about other entertainers of any kind. It just couldn't. Let me tell you what it was like to come home afterwards. By the time he got back to New England in 1823, 1824, it was indeed widely known that he was black, but not, you know, not universally. There were, there were people up in northern Vermont who still believed the uh, East Indian mother English father story. But uh, generally, it was very widely known. And he did, in fact, start to encounter uh, increasingly vituperative prejudice and uh, animosity at this time. But it was overwhelmingly countered by the kind of support and favor that he had found with so many Americans. He He put up with a lot. There were family tragedies. Uh, that, that heartbreaking part in the introduction uh, is not something I wanted to dwell on today, but it's, it's certainly true. Uh, he had three children. One of them died early, in the, the firstborn, in a farming accident uh, when he was five or seven, something like that. Uh, his son, Richard, and his daughter, uh, uh, Jeanette, Aunt Jeanette, actually, Aunt Jeanette. Anybody ever heard the name Aunt Jeanette before? It's Hindi. It's, it's Indian. And actually, while no, there was no East Indian mother involved, it's, it's actually fairly probable that Richard Potter got to India circa 1807 as an assistant for the man who taught him uh, ventriloquism and magic, or one of his major tutors, uh, James Rennie. Uh, but uh, Richard Potter Jr. was a ne'er-do-well. Uh, Potter's wife, Sally, bless her heart, uh, was a severe alcoholic. Uh, his daughter, Jeanette, as she went by, uh, was, you know, she was said to have been a little slow. It's hard to know whether that means she was just clueless or fetal alcohol syndrome or somewhere in between that amazing spectrum. We don't know. But she was impregnated at the age of about 14 and a half by a nearby tavern operator who was already a white man, 30-something, married with two or three children already. Alcohol was surely involved. And the town was utterly, utterly traumatized. There was actually a, uh, not a jury, a kind of panel of justices of the peace pulled together to discuss what to do about the issue, which wasn't legal protocol at all. And, and the 
lawyer for the defendant, the accused father, Richard Potter didn't bring this suit. Richard Potter had nothing to do with any of this. It was done, it was brought up by AJP. They decided that in, in the Bible, uh, uh, it, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't illegal because they weren't married, something like that. You know, it, the, a bloodline hadn't been tainted, and which wasn't the point at all. And, and frankly, in 19th century terms, the, the point was that she, as his daughter, was Richard Potter's property, and he had been injured by this act. That is a tort, and he had recourse against that, and there were penalties on the book for that, uh, and they were absolutely ignored, and nobody ever, 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 ever talked about this case again. Nothing was ever said about that daughter again. And we don't even know where she's buried. There were all sorts of stories. I have one theory. But there were all sorts of stories that had nothing to do with the truth because things were starting to get, you know, when you don't talk about the truth, you have to have fill that gap with something. So there was a lot of tragedy in this man's life. His son finally inherited the estate, uh, ran through it in about a year and a half, went off, joined the circus for a while, literally. Uh, tried to recreate the Potter Act in parts, traded on the name, couldn't pull it off. Uh, so the family line, so far as we know, peters out. But Richard Potter himself never changed. He was always known and he was always valued for the man he had been all the way through. This is published in the Boston Courier as you see, November 6, 1835, on page one. It was a celebration and a farewell to Richard Potter, written by a contributor to the newspaper. It was a letter from a reader, uh, a man of obvious learning and experience. He litters, it's, it's beautifully written, actually. Uh, it's full of quotations from Shakespeare and quotations from Horace in the Latin and allusions to American poets and, and, uh, and other literary figures and so forth. But uh, it, it talked about his introduction as a young boy to Richard Potter and the incredible impact it had on him and how all his life after that, whenever he went to the theater, he thought about Richard Potter. And whenever he was in a city and he saw the signs about Richard Potter, he always went into the show and it was always restorative to him. And then this was how he ended it. Uh, this is 1835, and there are railroads around now. Let's pause right there for a minute. Why hadn't you heard of the most famous entertainer of America 200 years ago? Well, because there were no photographs then. There were no recording devices then. There was no way of keeping accurate records of these people then. And moreover, he was performing not on the grand stage, but he was, and he did, but not in a dramatic company. He wasn't performing high drama, he was performing in taverns and long rooms and big auditoriums too. But this was popular entertainment, and you know, popular entertainment didn't get much attention until the last 40 years or so, really, just didn't. And so what it did to our culture, we weren't thinking about. And I've basically been trying to get you to think about that all this talk. Okay, all those years Potter was traveling by horse and carriage. Oh, by the way, matched team, fancy buggy, dressed to the nines. This was a gentleman out on display, as he always was. He was always on display and he always knew it. The last time the writer saw Potter, about three months ago, this was on the train. He's keeping up with the times. Richard Potter is now traveling to engagements by railway, railroad. He's taking the railroad from Lowell to Boston, but he's getting off halfway. This is, area, this is basically Woburn, Massachusetts. He's obviously got an engagement uh, to parse just a little bit. Uh, he's going to 
the same grotesque features, the same oracular voice. Uh, from an earlier passage in this same article, it's, it's very clear actually that uh, because this writer has used the word grotesque appearance about Potter before, and he was specifically referring to Potter's makeup in grease paint uh, for his, one, of, one of the parts of this act. And so it seems to be clear that Potter is traveling from one show to the other, and he's keeping the makeup on. And he probably doesn't have a wig on. He probably has his hair powdered at this point. But uh, that's where grotesque come from. Same bushy hair. You know, it turns out that in 1835 in America, bushy was code for mulatto. I didn't know that either. He gets off at Woburn. Everybody knew Potter. All right, sure, he's famous. He'd made arrangements to get off at a stopping point. The, the train has to stop for water. You could make arrangements like that. Potter did so ahead of time, but the other passengers didn't know that. People get off the train to stretch their legs. It takes a while to fill the, the, you know, the, uh, the boilers up with, with water again and so forth. And then the whistle blows to get back on the train and everybody gets, uh, and Potter didn't get back on the train, and all the other passengers are worried. And the train starts to move, and all the passengers are really worried. They care, and they know he's black, and they still care. This is just a beautiful last glimpse. It's the very last picture we have of Richard Potter. In November, in, in, uh, this would have been three months, it would have been early August. He was probably already ill with the disease that would kill him. Uh, he had enough medical bills that it computes out to being about uh, five or six weeks worth, and this was about uh, six weeks before he died. He probably knew he was ill by that time. He was still campaigning, and that's the impact he had on people. Remember I said no photographs, no sound recordings, so we don't know what they look like, what they sounded like, what they did. Uh, the daguerreotype comes along around 1837, 1838. Uh, 1841, a special lens is developed for the daguerreotype, and for the first time, portraits can be taken. And they are very deep depth, high information portraits. Uh, you've seen the early ones, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, they, they display incredible detail and richness and accuracy. And in 1841, as soon as it's possible, Frederick Douglass starts sitting for his portrait. The champion of abolition, the black champion of abolition, the mulatto champion, sorry, of abolition. Remember, he was. Frederick Douglass was always, for his photographs, dressed. He was a handsome man to begin with. Richard Potter was too. Richard Potter was a fairly small man. Uh, Douglass had, had stature and presence too, but photographs, you know, usually portraits, just your face. Uh, Richard, uh, uh, Fred, Frederick Douglass was a handsome man. He was always well dressed. He looked like somebody important and serious. And that is incredibly good weaponry to wield against the people who were drawing freehand pictures of pickaninnies as representatives of what blacks in America were like. In the 19th century, Frederick Douglass was photographed more often had more photographs of himself made than any other American, including Abraham Lincoln. Well, he lived a lot later than Abraham Lincoln did, so he had many years for that. But he was widely, widely distributed, and his visual impact was widely recognized as having incredible value for the abolitionist cause. All right, now. 1841, that starts. Richard Potter dies in 1835. And for the 25 year period there, from 1810 to 1835, more people in America 
had seen Richard Potter than had seen any other person. And the man they saw was always handsome, gentlemanly, decorous, well-dressed, soft-spoken, courteous. You can't tell me that doesn't make a difference on the national psyche. <laughs> I'm making the point that it must have, clearly, is, is the point I want to make. Uh, it's not the kind of thing we pay attention to, because these are, this is the non-existence of photographs. I mean, how do you go back there and so forth? But think about it. How could that common experience with a gentlemanly, outstanding, upstanding black citizen not have had its impact on its audiences. Richard Potter was very important to the cultural development of this country during his times. I'm going to stop there. I'm happy to take questions. Richard Potter's portrait was painted in 18, I've forgotten, 1815, 1816, 18, 18, 17, sometime in the 18 teens by uh, Greenleaf. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, he was a, a, a self-taught uh, uh, painter in Boston. And uh, one of Richard Potter's good white friends, the oldest son of the man who had employed him in Boston before he went off on a wedding trip as a servant to England and then ended up being allowed to hook up with a uh, tightrope walker apparently and get into show business in Europe. Uh, the Dillaway family and uh, Dillaway Jr. was a good friend and was having his portrait painted at the same time. Uh, we have actually no record that the, the portrait was ever in Potter's possession. And so I have come to think that Dillaway probably paid to have both their portraits painted because he cared about Richard Potter and he uh, was always a friend through Potter's life all through the Boston years. Uh, but there is no record of that portrait. There used to be theory of a record. Let me go back. A version of this broadside was something that uh, Potter used frequently. The woodcut in the center shows a ventriloquist. Uh, it was thought, and many ventriloquists would in fact incorporate this in their act, that they could also imitate the sounds of animals and birds very, very accurately as well as throw their voice and, and so forth. And the ventriloquist in this particular exhibition of his talents has imitated the sounds of various kinds of birds so accurately that he has attracted all these different species to the tree he is standing underneath. And Richard Potter used this as a woodcut exemplifying ventriloquism. And having a pictorial in the middle is a big attention catcher, you've got to admit. In the early, you've seen early 19th century, you know, just a picture, huh, something to look at, as opposed to all that tight little text. It's very eye attractive. Uh, but this woodcut was made for James Ranney, one of Potter's tutors, and is particularly in ventriloquism. Uh, James Ranney started using this woodcut in 1804. And Potter acquired it from Ranny in 1810 or 11 and used it in his own advertising thereafter. A broadside showing this woodcut, I don't know if it was this broadside or one almost exactly like it, was on display in the old Massachusetts State House, which became a museum in, in Boston. And uh, it was redesigned in the, oh, 1890s or something, 1880s. And uh, there were a couple of uh, reviews of the new exhibition at the museum that appeared in Boston newspapers. And one reporter talked about uh, a, a picture of Richard Potter 
hanging above the door in such and such a room. And uh, I don't know if the name Robert Olson means anything to anyone here, but Robert Olson, who is still alive, is one of the people who has kept Richard Potter's name alive all these years. Uh, he was working, he's a ventriloquist. I'm sorry, he's a, he's a magician. He was working as a uh, young man at the uh, village, uh, Sturbridge Village, and they asked him if he could get up a, you know, a 19th century magic act. And so he started doing research and he hit on Richard Potter. And by golly, he taught himself Richard Potter's sleight of hand tricks from 18th and 19th century magic books, the way Potter had learned them, actually. He did. It's wonderful. And he's been doing a Richard Potter reenactment, the magic act part, ever since the 1970s. He's still doing it. Uh, he found out about this. There's a picture of Potter that used to be in that museum. And he set me out to find it uh, like 15, 18 years ago or something like that. And I finally found this newspaper report and I actually was able to analyze the holdings of the museum. And they actually had documentation of what was where in what rooms that year. And it was this woodcut. So actually, if that ventriloquist is a portrait of anyone, and you know, it's about that big, how big, much of a portrait is going to be? It's a portrait of James Ranney. Richard Potter gets to England uh, in the uh, late 1790s, 1795, I've forgotten, something like that. And uh, uh, most likely, he was going as a, uh, the attendant of a new bride going with her husband and uh, on this uh, wedding trip to England, to the continent. Uh, and this was, uh, uh, this was, I think, one of the Dillaway daughters, uh, somebody really, you know, in that Boston area where he'd, he'd been living. Uh, he apparently connects in England with this guy, Signor Manfredi, an Italian tightrope dancer, uh, as was the case with many such performers. He, his whole family was in the business. Uh, his wife and two daughters were also tightrope dancers with him, but he was performing on his own for a while in England. And apparently Potter connects with them. There are various hints, some of which have to do with uh, uh, where they, you know, where Potter has appeared in England and so forth. It would have been as an assistant very, very clearly. Uh, and then Manfredi goes to France. And uh, then in 1803, uh, Manfredi comes to America. Now, Potter is certainly back here a long time before then. Potter has been back in America since uh, 1801 or so. But when Manfredi comes, he goes uh, flying up to Portsmouth before he comes, you know, from New York, goes flying up to Portsmouth before he comes back to Boston, which is kind of odd. But Potter was living in Portsmouth then, working at an inn down near the, uh, the, the dock. And uh, you see, this is an incredible woodcut, or, or you know, a series of six woodcuts that Manfredi had, had made for him, showing various balancing acts that he will be enacting. Uh, but in the small print, down at the bottom is noted, a person of this town will perform a number of feats on the rope with the balance pole. This is how Potter got into show business, was balancing and tightrope and slack rope and so forth. And that is probably, I think, it's a, it's a reasonably fair guess, probably the first mention of Potter, if not by name, that we have in the record of performance. Manfredi uh, tours for a while and then he goes, you know, he's, he's starting to, to, to perform in, I guess it's Boston, and then all of a sudden 
He's, he's announced a long stay, and then he's, he's only there two days. He fires off to Philadelphia. And what he's going to do is connect with this uh, other performer who's pulling actors you know, together in Philadelphia, who is John Ranney, the younger brother of James Ranney. Richard Potter apparently apprentices with John Ranney, who did play acting as well as magic and ventriloquism. John, An John Ranney soon then connects with his brother, older brother, James Ranney. And James Ranney is by far the better ventriloquist, probably the better magician, and also a, a balancing master and so forth, but, but uh, does not do the play acting and so forth. So Potter probably picked a lot of play acting hints and so forth from, from John, and uh, then certainly trained especially in ventriloquism with, with James. Uh, and his travels are mostly with James until about 1809 when he starts out on his own. Almost every career path in, that crosses the boundaries of circus type arts it's going to be just about that wild and weird. <laughs> yes? I just wondered if you could tell us how you discovered the <laughs> Oh, Yeah. Uh, I was a grad student in English when I got married. And uh, my wife, who was from New Hampshire, uh, her family had a summer place up in Andover, New Hampshire, which is where Richard Potter lived for the last 20 years of his life. When he wasn't on the road, I have to add, because he was on the road a lot. But uh, Richard Potter moved away from the Boston area, uh, very possibly wanted to get his wife away from the uh, temptations of the, the, the liquor of the city, basically. He was gone for such long periods of time at a stretch. She, like him, was uh, of a, uh, an estate, a manorial, a country background. She was skilled in those things. Uh, he told a, a, an inquisitive newspaper editor later, you know, I, I decided that what I wanted was to create a, a, a real home for myself that would serve as a pole star to always lead me back there where my wife could stay and, and my family could thrive while I was on the road. And so Andover, New Hampshire is where he lived and where he and Sally are buried and where his first son is buried. and probably where his daughter is buried too. I think I might know where that is, but there's no memorial anyway. And therefore, it's like the one place in the world, apart from magic societies, that still knows in 30 years ago who Richard Potter was. Anyway, I got very curious about him. I was studying American lit, 19th century American lit, 19th century English lit. That was my, my period. And uh, I just thought, you know, a lot of really interesting things about America are all coming together in this one guy, in this one kind of act. And from a very theoretical, you know, I, 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 I cringe when I think about it in a way, but, but not really. Uh, theoretically speaking, uh, Richard Potter was a man, a black man who passed as white by virtue of an act that has no color. He's a matriloquist. What color is that? And that's true, but that's just a hint of where you get following these saints. But, you know, his ambiguous history, the rumors about his history, uh, his passing, his success as passing, he was, I didn't realize how famous he was at the time. I don't think anybody did. Uh, but I, I, I knew he was regionally famous anyway, and I knew that he had a long and very successful career. He, he owned a, a big, he bought 60 acres, then he bought 80 more acres, then he bought 30 more later. Uh, he had a, a significant estate. It wasn't the richest place in Andover. But Newport is one of the towns that would appreciate this. Richard Potter's home, he actually designed. It was copied after the fashions of the most fashionable houses in places like Boston and Newburyport and Salem and Newport. It has, you have to look very hard, but you can see them. 
there are blind arches above, above each of these symmetrically windows. That's a 45 foot facade, nine foot sections. Each one has this centered huge window or in the center, of course the center, a door. It's very Federalist, it has the blind arches with the drapes carved into the wood. Uh, it has a, uh, uh, a gable above the uh, front door. You can't see it behind the tree, really. Uh, it was designed to be a showpiece, not to be a mansion, a showpiece. He was always on display. The yard was all cultivated with, with flowers and shrubs and so forth. When he built it, it was finished in 1815. In 1815, he bought two life-size wooden statues in Newburyport. They were the remnants of the old estate of a, an 18th century Newburyport crackpot uh, who had statues on pillars all around the estate. Uh, there were statues of, I think, Washington, Adams, and Jefferson over the uh, entry of the estate. And then there were statues of, oh, uh, f famous statesmen, uh, Aristotle, and uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, and, and so forth. All of these statues. And every now and then, one would fall out of favor, and he would have the woodcarver reshape it, and he would name it something else. And so the identities, but there were like 40 or 50 of these things. And eventually, hurricanes come along, the place falls apart. These things are being sold at the last auction. Potter, they're, they're going for two to, 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 to ten dollars, depending on condition. Probably, Potter probably bought two of them for the cost of a couple tickets to one of his own shows. Uh, there was one to uh, Timothy, it was Timothy, what was his name, Timothy what? He had erected one to himself. Uh, as basically the greatest philosopher of all time. Richard Potter brought them home. They're life-size, remember. Puts them symmetrically at the front of his house down by the road. Well, the road that goes by this house is the 4th New Hampshire Turnpike. It is the main road between Boston and Lebanon, Hanover, and then Montreal. It is the main road northwest out of Boston. This is the highway, and this is the fanciest house you're going to see on it, and there are these two statues out in front of it because he's always advertising, he's always on display, and he behaves accordingly. You know where he's buried? He and his wife, probably, right, originally, probably where the statues were, right down at the front. They were moved when the railroad came through, but he was a showman. He was good at it.